right, if you have your Bible, I hope you will open it to 2 Samuel chapter 13. As I recall back, this was uh, on Sunday the 12th when we um, introduced chapter 13. And we barely introduced it. And one of the things that you notice as you begin 2 Samuel chapter 13 is the wording, and this is the New American Standard update, verse 1. Now it was after this, and I'm guessing that whatever translation you have, it has something similar to that. Now after this. Now after what? What is it after? What's just occurred? There's, there's fewer of you this morning, so... Okay, war, there was a war with the, uh, with the Ammonites. There was the events of David and Bathsheba that were in that time period of that war that was going on, the besieging of the Ammonite city Rabbah. You have all of those things that were happening. So think about David, think about Bathsheba, think about Uriah the Hittite, think about the war that's just ended. Now it was after this. And so that's the connection that we have there. <clears throat> that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Did he love her? Well, it, it depends on how you define love, doesn't it? Uh, you have more you want to say about that? Yeah. When we talk about love, uh, we're talking about an aspect of love, a quality of love that has genuine care and concern for the other person. You love someone. You care about them. You care about them to this depth. You want to help them to be in the right relationship with God. You want to help them to get to heaven. You care about them in that way. You're sacrificial toward them in that way. When you love someone, it's going to include that when we think about it in a Bible sense. He didn't love her. He wanted her. He lusted for her. He craved her. But in a fleshly way. And it wasn't really caring about her. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago there are some parts, at least, of this lesson that I thought would be really good for young people to hear. And if they're going to hear it in this congregation, they're going to hear it by looking at it on YouTube afterward. Because we have classes for all of our ages. And this is not a combined class in a congregational sense in that way. So, <clears throat> our young people are and we were too. If you can remember back when, uh, you know, into your teen days, you loved someone. And you loved them so deeply and it hurt you if, you know, if you were going to break up with someone or they were going to break up with you and you hurt so deeply within because you loved them so much and you were just sure you had to be with them and uh, this was the one for you. And if you've had that kind of heartbreak, then you know that sense of that word love. And, and it's just this craving, this wanting, this desiring, but not really understanding the depth that love should have in a biblical sense. It's not that way. And today, our culture talks about love. In, there's so many ways to think about it, but only one way that's right in the sight of God. And uh, our young people talk about love. But it's a fleeting thing. It's a temporary thing. And it ends up with a lot of times young people just using each other's bodies and presence to satisfy an urgent craving. And then they go on to the next one. And, uh, and there's not a whole lot more to it than that. And our culture is steeped in that sort of thing, where if we're just consenting with one another, it's all okay, and, and uh, we love each other at least for the moment. 
But that's not the way the Bible defines love for us. It has more depth than that, more sides to it, and it's always going to involve God and godliness. And so you have this half-brother and half-sister, and it starts out in verse 1, he loved his half-sister, Tamar. He loved her, but he didn't really, and you can tell by his behavior, he didn't care about her. He cared about himself, but he didn't care about her. Sherry, your hand was up. Yeah, Sherry commented on this idea of love at first sight, that there's a, in order to understand love in its deeper sense, you have to have more than just this first appearance of a person. Love at first sight, you don't know that person, you don't know what they're like, you don't know what their standards are, you don't know if you have anything in common, you don't know if there's going to be friction when you get to know them, you don't understand any of that, and, uh, and so there's more to it. Now, it may turn out, that you had great interest at first sight, and it developed into a relationship that developed into marriage, that developed into 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years of marriage, and, and you know, happily ever after. It may end up that way, but it was great interest at first sight. But to understand the depth of love, there's more to it than that. So that's, that's an accurate way to talk about that. So here we are with Amnon and Tamar, and it said that in verse 1 that he, he loved her. Amnon was so frustrated because of his sister Tamar that he made himself ill, for she was a virgin, and it seemed hard to Amnon to do anything to her. That's an interesting wording, to do anything to her. That doesn't sound like love to me. That sounds like something else. That's the way my, what's yours worded as? It was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. That just seems like an odd phrasing to me. Uh, not with her, not for her, not because of her, not, you know, it, to her. It just seems like an odd wording to me for someone who's professing love for someone. And, uh, and so we go on from verse 2 to verse 3, but Amnon had a friend, all right? These are the, these components of this text that I thought, this is so interesting, and if I was a young person, these would be things that I would, I would highlight. Is he a friend? Who do we call our friends? What makes a person a friend? And so he, he had a friend whose name was Jonadab. Well, what's he like? What kind of friend is he? What's he encouraging? What's he helping him with? Is he a friend? Well, did he love her? These are words that need to be defined. We need to understand our relationships and what frames them. What kind of foundation do they have? He had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shemiah, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very shrewd man. He said to him, O son of the king, why are you so depressed morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Then Amnon said to him, I'm in love with Tamar. Look at the wording here. The sister of my brother Absalom. I want you to notice in this text, she is not my sister. She is the sister of my brother Absalom. Later, he calls her my sister. Later, he says, this woman. I just want you to listen to how he refers to Tamar through this text as you end up in different episodes of it, different actions going on. <clears throat> Not my sister, his sister. Oh wait, you're my sister. Oh wait, she's just this woman. And you look for little things like that in vocabulary that indicate a different frame of mind. So uh, Jonadab's a very shrewd man. 
wants to know why you're depressed morning after morning. He said, I'm in love with Tamar, the sister of my brother Absalom. Verse 5, <clears throat> Jonadab then said to him, lie down on your bed, pretend to be ill. When your father comes to see you, say to him, please let my sister Tamar come and give me some food to eat and let her prepare the food in my sight that I may see it and eat from her hand. So when you read in verse 3 that this Jonadab, um, not just a friend but a family member, is very shrewd. If you want to know what the word shrewd means, and you might have a different uh, word in your translation for shrewd, but it's going to be along those lines. If you want to know what that word shrewd means, look at the plan he devises. That's what it means by shrewd. He's shrewd in this sort of way. And then verse 6, so Amnon lay down, pretended to be ill. When the king came in to see him, Amnon said to the king, please let my sister Tamar come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. So um, he has this physical, emotional attraction to his half-sister but it's not what we would call love, not in its higher sense. And then he's very frustrated. And that word frustrated, maybe your text has a different word there if you're looking at a different translation. Uh, that's in verse 2. Uh, Amnon was so frustrated because of his sister Tamar, it, it has the meaning of being obsessed, that he is troubled over it, that he is... Um, uh, he is distressed, he is vexed, he is tormented. And if you can remember back maybe in your teenage years when you saw that opposite sex somewhere and you were infatuated with them and maybe you were vexed, maybe it kept you up at night, maybe you were obsessed, maybe you were tormented by the idea and you just thought, you know, I've, I've I really need to get to know this person and I want this person to be my boyfriend or my girlfriend and how serious that was to you. That's the way he's acting about it. He can't sleep, he can't eat, he can't function in life without being tormented and vexed by the thought of Tamar. And this is, uh, this is obsessed in a very worldly way. That's what he's interested in. Now she is his sister. All right, what do we know in the Old Testament law about that? Could, could a man marry his sister? Well, we're not sure. That was so long ago, right? That was a different law. That was a different time. Uh, well, what does it say about that? All right, I'm going to give you a verse. Leviticus 18, verse 9. The nakedness of your sister either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether born at home or born outside, their nakedness you shall not uncover. Well, that pretty, that pretty well spells it out, doesn't it? It doesn't matter whether it's a half-sister. You don't do that. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 17, if there's a man who takes his sister, his father's daughter, or his mother's daughter, so that he sees her nakedness and she sees his nakedness, it is a disgrace. And they shall be cut off in the sight of the sons of their people. He has uncovered his sister's nakedness. He bears his guilt. So he was frustrated because of his sister Tamar. He made himself ill over it. And uh, she was a virgin. That speaks to her character. Because of her character, he found it difficult to do anything to her. And then she's the daughter of the king. He found it difficult to do anything to her. The law forbade it. He found it difficult to do anything to her. There's a number of reasons you could tack on to that idea. Uh, but, but he just found this to be an impossible thing and he can't figure his way around it. And uh, he has this friend who's very shrewd. By the way, Jonadab is not just a friend. He's a family member in what way? He's a cousin. So he's a cousin to Amnon. But he's also a cousin to Tamar and to Absalom. 
and David's his uncle. It's more than just his cousin. He's related to everybody involved in this thing. But he's playing favorites right now with Amnon. Why do you think that is? I don't know that we can say for sure, but you, you might have a good guess at it. Why would he be playing favorites with Amnon? Maybe a gender thing, guys. But he wasn't that way with Absalom. He didn't care about Absalom. He didn't, didn't care about the rest of the kids. So it's more than just a guy thing. Maybe something about his particular mother. Maybe something connected there. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe something like that. Anything else? All right, we're, we're, we're going to find something as we keep studying here and see if it makes any sense with it. Um, Jonadab, we're learning about his character through this whole thing. We're learning more and more and more about the character of Jonadab. He's a skunk. And, um, and we're going to see more of that come out as, as we move deeper into this. Um, this is something else that I thought, you know, if, if this was a setting with young people, and maybe somebody will pick up on this and do a, uh, you know, maybe there'll be a youth rally somewhere and somebody will use this text and have the ear of the young people with this. There's a good lesson here for girls about boys. What will boys do to have conquest over a girl? What games will they play? What things will they say? What schemes will they lay to have her? I remember when I was in high school, I started to hear some of my so-called buddies talking about girls, and it sort of threw me back about the way they talked about them. And I still hear it today, even with grown men. There's a lesson here for girls about what boys will do. And if you look at Proverbs chapter 5 and Proverbs chapter 7, there's a lesson there about what girls will do. In Proverbs 5 and 7, you have the adulteress, the harlot, and the way she schemes and the way she plots and the way she dresses herself and the way she presents herself and the words that she uses to lure in the man. There's a lesson about the kind of plotting and scheming that someone will do. They don't care about you. They care about getting what they want. And if they can get you convinced that it's what you want too, they'll scheme and plot and plan and do whatever they can to make that happen. And so there's a, a great lesson in this, and we need to pay good attention to it. So... Jonadab, verse 3, this shrewd guy, cousin of Amnon, cousin of Tamar. Uh, he knows how to get stuff done. He's crafty. He's subtle. He's a manipulator. And he doesn't have good moral scruples. He doesn't care about any of those sorts of things. Just knowing how to get what he wants and how to help Amnon get what he wants. How often is he seeing his cousin Amnon? How, how often does he see him? Daily, morning after morning, he said, why, why is it morning after morning I see you this way? So he sees him real regular on a daily basis. They have that kind of closeness as cousins and, and companions and friends. And you hear a little bit of the distance in the end of verse 4. I'm in love with Tamar, the sister of my brother Absalom. You hear the family distance there? We talked about this a couple weeks ago that uh, David broke the rules of marriage. He had multiple wives, concubines, uh, and, and, and whatnot, and had children by multiple women, and, and there's, there's distance that you hear in that. She's the sister of my brother Absalom, and you hear distance in that. There's not, it's not like a close-knit family, and they're not growing up. They're not even under the same roof right now. He's under his own roof, and she's under the roof of her father, David. And, and so there, there's distance there, and you can hear it in the language. And the plan is to pretend illness and create an alone situation with her. 
I'm going to pretend I'm ill, create a, a situation where we're going to be alone. Watch out for that. If, especially if you're infatuated with someone, if you're attracted to someone, and there is this opportunity to create an alone situation. Don't do it. Don't go along with that. Don't leave it up to him and don't leave it up to her. And then just go along with it. When you get in those alone situations, unchaperoned settings, and you have a physical attraction, that's got red flags all over. Just don't, don't do that. We always want to believe the best about those situations. But it's foolishness to believe that those situations are going to go somewhere good. That is very, very dangerous. So, um, so he's going to create this alone situation. He's reported to be ill. David, his father, comes to see him. Does he respect his father? Does Amnon respect his father? The text doesn't really talk about it, but I'm, look, I'm asking you to know the tree by its fruit. When you come and manipulate your father, deceive your father, tell a lie to your father, that's not respect. And that's what he's doing to David. And so you have no respect for his father. And then I want you to notice this, and this goes back to something I asked you previously. I want to go back to chapter 3, 2 Samuel chapter 3. And I want you to notice this. Verse 2, sons were born to David at Hebron. His firstborn was who? Amnon. And I'm telling you, Jonadab is a skunk. Why does he play favorites with Amnon? I think this is part of it. He's aligning himself with the next king. I think there's a reason. And when Amnon's out of the picture, we're going to find out he's in cahoots with Absalom to some degree. And then we're going to hear when things go awry, he's trying to align himself back with David. He is looking to be in the favor of whoever's in control. That's the one he wants to be in line with. And he will change loyalties midstream depending on what's going on. And I think that this being the firstborn son of David has a big part of why these two cousins are so close together and Jonadab wants to help him to get what he wants. Now I don't know that that's a fact, but I'm very suspicious of it. Well, back in chapter 13, we'll go back there. And, uh, of course, Amnon, being the firstborn, he may have felt superior. He may have felt entitled. He may have felt invincible. He is heir to the throne. That was what would be expected. And so here's Jonadab and Amnon plotting together. Now, you might have some other comments right here before we go on to verse 7. Yeah, Joe, uh, Joe brings up, if you're at home, all they see is me. Uh, we have multiple Joes now, so it's Joe Joshuan uh, mentioned uh, that there's something here about the morals of the father and seeing that it is so similar in the morals of the son, as was David in scheming and plotting and wanting to get what he wants and that. Now you see the same sort of uh, lack of good moral behavior in Amnon. And so, as he said, the nut doesn't fall far from the tree. And we're seeing that. And you, if you begin to ask yourself, as things begin to play out and sin is seen and things that need discipline, why isn't David jumping in there and doing that? 
taking control of his family, taking control of his sons, and disciplining where he ought to, and abiding by the law of God. Why is that? I, I think there may be something in that, and I, I have to say I think, because the Bible doesn't spell it out. This is a maybe, a might be, and I think there's something to it to consider. How, how do you discipline that in your son when it's been a part of your own life? That becomes very difficult, doesn't it? And you'll find that when someone partakes of sin in their own life, they will be the voice that is most lenient toward others who fall into the same trap and want to be permissive about it. I think there's something to consider about David's sin with Uriah and Bathsheba and all that mess that went on and how he's handling these situations because they are very similar in a lot of ways. All right, we're going to go on with uh, verse 7 through 11. Then David sent to the house for Tamar. He's bought into the ruse. David sent to the house for Tamar, saying, Go now to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house, and he was lying down. And she uh, took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his sight and baked the cakes. She took the pan and dished them out before him, but he refused to eat. And Amnon said, Have everyone go out from me. So everyone went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, Bring the food into the bedroom, that I may eat from your hand. So Tamar took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the bedroom to her brother Amnon. When she brought them to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come lie with me, my sister. Uh, she's the sister of my brother, Absalom. Now she's my sister. And we're in the middle of the ruse and plot. It's all playing out. And he's got her alone. He's got her in his bedroom as if he's so sick he can't get out of his sick bed. And uh, he's got her where he wants her. And everybody else has gone out of the room. And now he grabs a hold of her and he won't let her go. And that's the line that he drops on her. So Tamar is in the house of David. Amnon's in his own house. Probably not a lot of regular interaction. Probably not a lot of crossing of paths between the two. Again, he found it difficult to do anything to her. Their paths don't really cross that much. They're in different locations. And he plays this thing out. Then verses 12 through 14, she answered him, No, my brother. And I want, this is her outline for life. This is her outline, how she thinks, her character. She answered him, No, my brother, do not violate me. For such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do this disgraceful thing. As for me, where could I get rid of my reproach? And as for you, you'll be like one of the fools in Israel. Now therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not listen to her, since he was stronger than she, and he violated her and lay with her. He grabbed hold of her, wouldn't let her go. He was stronger than her, and he overcame her. And she was pleading for him in as many ways as she could think of not to do that. All right? Let's, uh, let's begin. Yes. Okay.
Uh, if, I'm, if I'm getting this right, Sherry, you're asking the question um, about why it was difficult for him to do anything to her. Is it because she was a virgin? Is it because the law, law forbade it? Is it uh, because it was his sister? Uh, I, I think yes. You know, and that's, that's what I was trying to line out, and I hope that came through all right, that I think there's many component parts to this is, one, they're under different roofs. Their paths don't cross much. Two, they're brother and sister, forbade by the law. She's a virgin. Her character is a stellar character. She's not of that sort. I think there's a lot of component parts to this about why it was difficult for him to do anything to her. Her character, the law forbade it, it's his sister, and their paths don't cross. I think there's a lot of things going on here. But this idea that when she says, you can ask our father, you can ask the king, and he won't withhold you from me, I think this is a last ditch effort on her part to try to get him to let her go. She's going, to, she's going to say whatever she can to get out of this situation. And can David, as king, can he give permission for them to be together if God's law forbids it? Can man authorize what God forbids? And the answer is no. So even if David put a stamp, as king, if David put a stamp of approval on that, David's going further into sin himself. Man cannot permit what God forbids. We need to remember that. That's a basic principle lesson. Today, we, we cross that all the time. You might, um, you, you'll hear that at work. I'm getting, I'm getting ready to uh, start studying for a series, uh, a Bible study series in First and Second Timothy and Titus. And one of the things that I ran across already in my preparation for that class is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where a woman is not to usurp authority over the man, not to have or exercise authority over the man. It's the reason that we have some of our gender roles in the New Testament church. And you'll run across this. Some people will say, well, she can't usurp authority. That's King James. She can't usurp authority. The wording is, she is not to have that kind of authority, period. And the way some have got around that is they say, well, she's not usurping authority because um, the elders have granted it to her. So she's not stealing it. She's not taking it. She's not overpowering it. It's been granted to her. And the answer is that's not what the text says. The text says she's not to have it. Can't, she cannot have that role in the assembly. She can't have it. That's God's law. And man can never permit what God forbids. Can't do it. That was my answer one time in a conversation, Christian sister. They're having trouble in their marriage. And she called to ask a preacher about what the Bible says. Can I do this? He was giving her permission to go outside of their marriage in a relationship. And she, she's at, she, and she called me and she said, what, what about that? And my answer was short and sweet. Your husband cannot permit what God forbids. And a light bulb went off. We'll run across those things all the time where if, if the elders say it's okay, if the preacher says it's okay, if my friend says it's okay, if my husband or wife says it's okay, no human being can permit what God does not authorize. So even if David would have authorized that, the law was forbidding him. We've already read that text. I think Tamar's just trying to get out of there. And she's giving all these reasons and all these options to her brother to let her go and don't do this thing. It's disgraceful. And so that seems to be the reasoning there. Now, um, 
she lists these arguments. Uh, it, don't viol it's a violation of me. Don't violate me. It's not done in Israel. This isn't the way God's people behave. Number three, it's disgraceful. And number four, you're going to put a reproach on me that I'll never be able to get rid of. You are going to change my life forever. If you do this to me, my life will never, ever, ever be the same. Where could I possibly go to get rid of this disgrace, this reproach you're putting on me? And then she tells him, you will be as a fool in Israel. Word meaning senseless, worthless, godless, as an unbeliever. You will be like one of those. You're going to be the next king. And this is, this is how you're going to present yourself and what everybody will think about you if you do this. So she gives all these reasons and then finally speak to the king. He might allow the marriage. And that seems to be a desperate plea to get out of it. Yeah. All right, I, I have a clue, and the clue is this. When did Abraham and Sarah live as versus where we're at now? Before the law. Before the law, patriarchal period of time. Evidently, there was some difference, and you will find that, for example, somebody will always ask this question when you talk about creationism. Um, who, who did, uh, who did uh, Cain marry? Who did Abel marry? Who did Seth marry? Yeah, so it, w it would have been a sister and, and, or, or some, you know, and so, uh, but there was a difference in the purity of the genetic makeup from the very beginning of time for a period of time. There was a pureness of genetic makeup whether or not that's part of the reasoning or not, but it was a necessity in the beginning. And, uh, and then as time progressed and you come to the Old Testament law, there's a difference. Now the law speaks differently. Yeah. The, the next question is about, uh, about the Leverite marriage where um, a brother dies, has no offspring, and, and the next brother in line is supposed to marry her. So in that case, the brother is deceased, and in the law, there's an allowance. So you let the law generally stand, brothers and sisters don't uncover their nakedness. You don't do that. That is a violation of God's law. Is there a clause? Is there a condition? Yes, the Leverite marriage. The same as we would say the general rule of marriage is one man, one woman, for life, period. Is there a clause? Is there an exception? Yes, there is. What is it? Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 12. So you have the general law, but then you have some exceptions that God puts in play because of unusual circumstances. But this one with David giving permission for them to marry is not one of those clauses. That would be a violation. David would have no right to do that. So you have all this reasoning of Tamar trying to get out of this situation. Uh, by the way, you are going to notice there is a drastic difference here. Now, maybe, maybe it's just the recording of Scripture. Maybe it, it, it includes it here, but it didn't include it there. That's a possibility. On the surface, there's a drastic difference here between this sexual violation. There's a big difference here between what's going on between Amnon and Tamar and David and Bathsheba. You see the difference? Tamar is in an alone situation she wants no part of this. There's nobody else around anywhere, but she's doing everything she can do to get away from this. She's giving reasoning, she's giving Bible, she's giving logic, she's, 
She's trying to do everything she can to get out of this. And her brother has a hold of her, and he is stronger than her, and he overcomes her and violates her. You don't read anything like that with David and Bathsheba. But you read about it here. There's something very different about this situation. Joe, Joe mentions that uh, uh, if, if he did this thing, it would remove him in line from being on the throne. More than that, he should be executed. According to law, he should have been executed. He should have been killed for this. And, and David does nothing. He does absolutely nothing. He's infuriated by it. He's unhappy with it. He's displeased with it. But he doesn't do anything about it. He should have been executed. But so should David. David should have been executed. And, uh, and so you see the sins of the father and the sins of the son. Why doesn't the father act against the son? There's probably a lot going on there. And you're right. We're guessing about a lot of things in class today. We're, I'm just putting, and you may not agree with a lot of things I'm suggesting. And that's fine. Study through it. Draw your conclusions. And yes, there are some things the Bible doesn't spell out here. But there are some evidences circumstantial and otherwise that are in play that need to be brought to the table and consider the facts of what's going on here. And that's all I want to do today is throw in these facts, get them on the table so that we understand everything that's going on around this. And whether or not certain conclusions are warranted, that's up to you. Take it home and study through that and think about it. But this is quite a situation that has developed here. So he's physically stronger than his sister, and he violates her. He overcomes her. And, uh, and there's a section in Deuteronomy 22 dealing with laws on morality. And, uh, and you can read about that. We don't have time to do it for now. But Leviticus 20.17 tells us that Amnon should be, and the wording in Leviticus 20.17 is cut off. He should be cut off. At least that means removal from the nation. And at the most, it's the death penalty. That's what should have been done. But that's not what's going to be done there. So with that, we're going to end. Next, next week, we'll come to now the deed's done, the sin is performed, and now you come to the shame element. And that's the way sin works. You want it, you're desperate for it, you crave it, you've got to have it, you're going to manipulate everything to get to it, and then the deed is done. Now what comes? Read James chapter 1. Then sin brings forth death. Now here is the aftermath. Here is the shame. And we pick up with that in verse 15 next week. Thank you for dismissing.